Hi, I'm Rob. I'm the founder and president of Cabot Guns. Uh, at Cabot, we make the 1911 style pistol. It's the one and only thing we do. And we make it not because, only because it's our favorite gun, because it's an iconic American firearm. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the 1911 uh, with Carter. Carter is one of our very capable gunsmiths, and he's also our uh, local in-house historian. So, uh, Carter, uh, give us a little bit of background of uh, the 1911, maybe starting at around uh, the trials and uh, maybe even before that. Like, what prompted the trials? First, it all started with John Moskowitz Browning, of course. Um, he took out four patents in 1898. And those were a variety of mechanisms for how a firearm would work. But what we're going to follow today is his tilting barrel patent. Okay. Uh, the first commercial gun to come from that was the Colt 1900. Um, the Colt 1900 was the direct you know, grandfather of the 1911. It was in 38 ACP caliber. It had forward cocking serrations only, uh, no external you know, thumb safety, grip safety, no slide stop, no last shot hold open. The magazine release was a heel-mounted magazine release. Uh, this gun also, unlike the 1911, had a two-link barrel system. So, What do you mean by two-link? What you have here is a 1911 barrel. You have right. a link in the back, and it's the typical you know, tilting breech gun, where the back drops back and down, you know, the back end of the barrel comes down, allows for easier loading. Now, what this two-link design did is it had another link right up here. Holy cow, I've never and so seen that what before. the barrel did is it just came back and down, no tilting involved. The majority of the reason for the change in that system was that it then allowed the nose of the gun to be all the way around as opposed to kind of an, like mm -hmm. a U-shaped slide. Because what would happen was if that link up front for that front link broke, then the slide could just come right back off right. and hit a person. Whereas now you have the nose of the slide that would actually have to break off before it came back and hit the shooter. So basically, the Army had recently adopted its 38 caliber double action revolvers. After the Philippine insurrection, one of the main lessons that they came away with was that their revolvers were wholly inadequate. But so after that, um, the Army commissioned the Thompson Lagarde test, or okay. Thompson Lagarde Commission. Um, side note, this is the same John T. Thompson who ended up developing the Thompson submachine gun. Uh, this was a little earlier in his career. But in the Thompson Lagarde test, they were said they were told, okay, find the caliber that we need to have for a pistol to be an effective, you know, quote unquote, man stopper. Um, well, being 1900, they didn't exactly have ballistics gel, ballistics clay. Um, they ended up using livestock what, and what, cadavers. What kind, what kind of livestock? Uh, cows, for the most part. Cows. So live cows and dead cows and you know human cadavers for their ballistic testing. Oh, hang on, human cadavers? Human cadavers. Um, and one of the most like, highly criticized bits of it, they ended up hanging human bodies you know, so they could swing freely, and then shooting the bodies with various pistol calibers that were available on the market. The United States military needed a handgun caliber of at least 45 or larger. Mm -hmm. So Thompson, he kind of had some inroads with Colt, who was helping mm -hmm. uh, Browning design the 1911 eventually. And, uh, he told them, he leaked to them ahead of time, that the government was going to be looking for a 45. So Colt went to Browning, they kind of got together, and they came up with the 45 ACP cartridge. So we call that inside information these days, a little bit advanced uh, knowledge on what they're looking for? Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a lot of that. Um, Especially if you had connections with somebody in the industry, you just kind of slipped them a little yeah. something. You know, there was no way to really tell. And, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm no expert, but I bet that goes on today, too. <laughs> so the first uh, developmental handgun to come out with the 45 ACP cartridge mm -hmm. was the Colt 1905. This looked much like the Colt 1900. Okay. Um, they start submitting the guns more and more to the military, mm -hmm. and the military starts giving them feedback, and they go back and forth and start adding features. Yeah. Uh, one of the largely underappreciated facts, mm -hmm. I think, is that the U.S. Cavalry was one of the largest factors in the reason the 1911 you know, became what it was. Well, first they start complaining, 
oh, the recoil on the 45, it's so harsh. And Colt just has to say, yes. <laughs> 45 has more recoil than 38. Big round, yeah. Then the cavalry guys complain, oh, we gotta use a second hand to load a magazine into the gun. Right. And they say, yes, that's kind of how this works. But then they start coming with some more valid criticisms. Okay, like what? They say, okay, we need some kind of safety on there. Because there was an initial safety on the 1900 that was cumbersome and odd and you know, was taken off almost immediately. But so Colt and Browning kind of you know, give in and they incorporate the grip safety. So that placates you know, the request for a safety at first. Then they're like- Dude, This is still the 1905? Um, the grip safety was incorporated into the 1907. 07, okay. But like I said, like each year you're yeah. coming out with different models. And by the way, we're talking about the 1911 and its history, but it's pretty fascinating. And John Browning was one of seven brothers, right? Yeah. But collectively, if you look at the body of their work, they developed a prototype every three months throughout the course of their development in history. So the prolific nature of, of what they developed in the variety of firearms is, is really incredible. But uh, let's, let's, sort of get, let's get back to uh, where in the 1907, they add the grip safety, and after that, how, where, where does it go from there? So I mean, the cavalry is complaining, well, okay, so we have to use a second hand to load a magazine. Yeah. How about a way to actually charge the gun with only one hand? Well, that's gonna give us our slide stop. Okay. So, you know, you incorporate a slide stop, so then the slide is locked back after you expend all your ammo. So, new mag in, you can drop the slide with one hand. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. And then, well, okay, what can we do about this mag catch? Because it's a heel-mounted mag catch, you have to use two hands. Okay, let's put on the side-mounted mag catch. So, let's just talk about the, uh, the heel mag. Yes. Uh, I think you have one here. Right. So... Sh it's, a very, it's considered very European today, but what you end up doing is pulling this latch on the bottom, which then allows the magazine to be taken out. Right. So it's definitely a two-handed operation, no matter how you slice it. The big trial that most people will talk about is the 1905 trial. Colt, um, Luger, and the Savage. Uh, Luger, at the time, was busy. They were equipping all sorts of European militaries with handguns. And at the time, the United States wasn't exactly a first-rate power. So yeah. they kind of got put on a back burner. But Luger was still located abroad in yeah. Germany. Yeah, and so, I mean, they're definitely gonna take care of their European contracts, mm -hmm. their local contracts, before they try to ship some pistols overseas. Yeah, um, and was it, was it the Luger of what people currently consider, what think about when they think about the, the, the Luger? So in, Every, in pretty much every respect except for size, it was a standard, mm -hmm. you know, Luger. Um, probably would have been a 19, an 05 or an 06 model at that point, I don't know. But it was a nine millimeter Luger just scaled up to take 45 magazines in the 45 caliber cartridge. So, um, but it was just too much effort for them to try to go back and forth with the military, you know, being, you know, a language barrier and overseas mm -hmm. and already way too busy. Mm -hmm. So then the military said, hey, Savage, do you want to get in on this kind of improvement process that we want to work on you with? And they're like, yeah, they were all for it. So um, Savage and Colt both went into kind of a couple years of um, that process of making guns, shipping them out, and you know, getting feedback and making improvements. Uh, after that development process, um, you know, more changes were made to the Colt offering. Um, like I said, you start getting the thumb safety because the military decided that the grip safety wasn't enough. Browning makes a pretty big change. In 1910, what Browning finally did was change the grip angle of the 1911 to what we know today. And at this point, you have all the same external controls. Um, and with a few subtle tweaks and changes to the ejection ports and the extractor, you know, the next year you get the 1911, which is yeah. mechanically exactly what we know it and, to be And today. without question, I mean, the, the ergonomics of the 1911, as anyone who shoots the 1911 will tell you, that's it's the beauty of the gun. It just fits the hand so perfectly. Yeah. And it's amazing to me how, how we got it just ergonomically so perfect. Yeah. So, 
uh, military adopted the 1911. Um, they were pretty happy with it. It served through World War I. Um, kind of in contrast to the Philippine insurrection, I'll give you a little story from Sergeant York, okay. uh, well-known Medal of Honor recipient from the First World War. Uh, he was storming a couple machine gun positions and all he had left was his pistol. And he's in a trench and he's confronted by six Germans with rifles and bayonets who are charging at him. And he is able to dispatch all of them with one magazine from his Colt. You know, that would be something that would be highly unlikely with, say, a 38 caliber double action revolver. Right. Um, so they certainly created, you know, a very effective fighting weapon. Um, after World War I, you had some time to ruminate on some changes. What you end up getting is the 1911A1. What the 1911A1 did was it improved the sights a little bit. Yeah, and let's talk about that because there's also a lot of confusion about, you know, what's the 1911 versus the A1. The biggest improvement was the sights. Well, not as good as our modern sights. It was, they made the sights a little larger. Right. Uh, one common flaw of pistols at the turn of the century is the sights are very tiny. Uh, they also added a, an arched mainspring housing. Mm -hmm. And what that did was it pushed the pistol up a little bit, right. which uh, made it more comfortable and more natural to point of aim for a lot of shooters. Mm -hmm. um, what they also did was add scallops around the trigger here. Um, before it was just one solid piece with no kind of inletting there. They also shortened the trigger up quite a bit. That gun's produced through World War II. After World War II, so many have been made that the government stops taking orders. Yeah, that's, that's enough 1911s for now. And that supply lasts until uh, 84 when it's eventually replaced by the Beretta. So yeah, I mean, during that time, the 1911 really established itself as um, kind of the quintessential American semi-auto handgun. It became, started becoming more and more popular with civilians. And you know, the more civilians you have running around with it, the more modifications you want. So then you start getting little cottage industries of people making modifications, uh, people using them in competitions. And at that point, it just starts escalating you know, until you get what we have today, where you have such a huge variety of manufacturing available. Um, from your rock islands to your cabins, where you have pretty much all the options you can imagine. No doubt, I mean, and as a uh, mechanical instrument, the longevity of the general design being around for over 100 years uh, is testament to, I mean, what else from that era is still relevant today? And the gun, at least to me, is, I mean, represents more than just simply a firearm or a tool. I mean, we are holding a piece of American history here. And from a very long process that we kind of went through in history to today, uh, it's an important American design. And uh, at least at Cabot, we feel humbled to continue that tradition in building the gun. So yeah, interesting stuff, uh, Carter. Um, an American classic that has a good chunk of history to it. No so. doubt. All right, well, thanks, Carter. All righty, good talking to you.